Hello, I am teaching artist Lauren Welch. Welcome to our stream. I am here today with Professor Liu, and today we've got an Elements of Art stream for you. It's all about space, lots and lots of space. But for that, if your studio habits need a kick in the butt, Art Prof has everything you need, tutorials, critiques, and professional development. Clara, can you explain where space is in the elements of art? Because when we first talked about this, I had a misunderstanding of what you meant by space. I thought you meant more like compositionally positive and negative space, but you're talking about something different here. We're talking about the illusion of space, at least within the context of 2D artwork. We will get to actual 3D artwork at some point. But the elements of art, if you are not familiar with them, they're basically the building blocks of visual art. They're the absolute basics, and they're easy to forget about. So I think that this is a great review for everybody, regardless of your experience. We have covered these other four elements, texture, shape, line, and value. So you guys can check out those videos. Space is so tricky to explain, Lauren. Why do you think that is? Space, I mean, what is space? Space is the absence of other things, is what I feel. We, my life is dictated by objects and things that I run into. And then space is something that we move through. So how do you depict that? Well, that's the trouble. If you want to talk about texture, it's like, oh, can I touch it and feel the texture? It's very concrete. Now, here's the issue with space. And tell us in the chat. Does space confuse you in the context of 2D artwork? Because if it does, you're not alone. Everybody is confused by it because space is literally everywhere. Like you cannot exist on the planet without having space. It's invisible. It's also intangible. You cannot touch it and yet you're in it all the time. And there's also this idea of the illusion of space and a 2D artwork. So it's like, what do we do with this? It's invisible. It's an illusion. It's intangible. It's everywhere. It's like, where do I even begin? My feeling is that you can measure it in terms of spatial intervals. So that is basically looking at the space between two objects. Does that help, Lauren? <laughs> I think you're going to need to explain it more, Clara, because this is going into science prof or math. No! <laughs> no! <laughs> I don't need to go there. You're already talking about intervals, and my brain is going, Woo, do I have to do calculus now? That's the last time I heard about intervals. <laughs> All right. Well, how does this work for you? You got your two hands. You look at the space that's in between the two hands. And so that's how you define the space. You look at the hands and you look at what's in between them. And so if you think about space as being like cut up by all these objects and what's the space in between the objects, for me, that makes it a little bit more digestible. So let's take a look at some examples. Like people talk a lot about negative space. So Lauren, what do people mean by negative space? Negative space is the area that is not filled by an object, which is positive space. So when we're looking at something, we recognize the object. If you see, there, there's a common thing, the, the, the faces and the vase, uh, what do you call that? That, uh, uh, optical illusion. And that is a game of positive and negative sp uh, space. So one, if you're looking at the vase, then the area on either side is the negative space because the positive is the vase. But if you're seeing the faces, the positive is the faces and the negative, the negative space is that vase-like shape. I don't know. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. Well, if you contextualize it here, for example, this is Sydney Hurwitz, who is a wonderful printmaker. I know these look like watercolor paintings, but they're aquatints. And if you guys are printmaking nerds, aquatints are 
hard to make and to make color aquatints is even harder. So these are just exquisite prints. But so I think what a lot of people forget about is to look at the stuff around the subject. So like we have all these pipes and all these industrial shapes and some people might say, oh, well, I'll just draw those and then I'll have the space. But actually you have to think about what's behind the architecture, what's to the left of the pipe, what's in between the pipes. So I think to a certain degree, space is just as much about how you think about the space. Is that making any sense? Totally. And I'd also like to add with this, with everything you just said, Clara, in these particular images that are very architecturally oriented, a lot of that space is also being dictated by the very extreme shadows. That's almost like another set of N not negative space, but it is this this in between element where you can tell that the object is receding or overlapping with other parts of the object, which contributes to the space. We have a question from Charisma who's asking, what's an aquatint? I'm not going to explain the whole thing because it's too complicated, but aquatint is a form of etching. So etching is where you have a copper plate and you actually put acid onto it that etches away on the plate and then you print it with printing ink through a professional printmaking press. The point is, aquatint is freaking hard. <laughs> and oh my God, my head would explode if somebody asked me to make a multicolor aquatint. So these are just brilliant, amazing masterpieces of aquatint in my opinion. But yeah, I mean, I think, what we're trying to say in this whole element series is that all of this is related. The color, the lighting, the space, the texture. So you almost can't talk about one element without talking about the others, right? For sure. Especially with space. I feel like a lot of it is dictated by the other elements that then make up the space. Okay. Now, space can be defined in other ways as well. For example, you can define space with color. So how does that happen here, Lauren? So color is the one area that I know, guys. I don't know anything else except for how to do this with color. <laughs> so one thing, if you guys have heard about atmospheric perspective, we talked a little bit about it on some of our other streams, is that colors with or colors that have high contrast either in hue or in, in tone come forward. And then ones that are more uh, close together, either muted or close together, either in hue or in value, they fall back. And that's this idea of, of your eye loses detail as it's seeing back into space. And so you can use those rules to make things come forward in your paintings using color and have other things fall back without having all of this angular stuff going on in, in Sydney's aqua tints. Neil is saying, what about space in abstract art? Well, it's perfect you mentioned this, Neil, because I think in abstract art, color really plays an important role in defining space because these are pieces by Sangram Majumdar, who actually, I went to art school with him. Isn't this so funny? He was a year behind me at RISD and was always a brilliant painter. I mean, I'm not surprised that he's done so well, but I think regardless of the image, certain colors come forward, others go back. Like how does that work in this painting, Warren? In this painting here, this red, which, I'm going to call it a figure. This is an abstract piece. I don't know what this is, but that red comes forward. It is the most saturated and the most highly contrasted with the things around it. There is nothing as saturated as that, especially if you're looking at the ground there that is this very toned down gray. So that's really coming forward. And then in the back, you have these darker, more muted colors, these olives that mix with these blue greens. And because they're very close to Together, they fall back like that and create this cavernous effect. 
Gypsy Heart says, I struggle with foreshortening of objects in their space. What is a good way to practice that or any tips to help? I think the main tip I have for foreshortening is that foreshortening looks weird. Things never look normal. So let them look weird. People try to make it look, quote, normal, and it never works out. So just let it look strange. The other thing is we do have a tutorial on foreshortening in the context of the human figure. So if you guys go to the playlist, find the one that's anatomy for artists. And in that stream, I explain foreshortening in great depth. So check that out. Okay, how about here? Like this is a very abstract image. Like the last one was a little bit figurative, but how about this one, Lauren? I love this piece. And I think that it is the perfect one to explain how color can work in showing space because there it's very frontal. There is no use of line to show a recess back into space. It's very parallel to your gaze. And so what you have is, I, I believe this is mostly being done with, with value. You have this very bright, gray, it almost feels like a sheet of paper stuck in front of your face that looks like it has holes in it into this other world in the background that is all of these very colorful stripes. And that contrast is what's causing that gray and that it's, it's a unified gray. That gray is all within the same world to come forward like that. So that's another thing to think about is you can create space by separating your worlds out if that makes sense, um, I like one one color relationship, one set of color relationships, separating that out from another set of color relationships. Slapnir says, doesn't abstract art sometimes mess with space and does the opposite and flattens out space? Oh, yeah. I mean, the whole thing about space, as we're talking about it in this stream, the space doesn't have to make sense. There are certain pieces we looked at, like the Aquitans at the beginning, those were very recognizable, like industrial spaces. But some of the pieces we've looked at by Sangram Majumdar are not like that. They just show the feeling of space without having literal recognizable objects. So this all applies to abstraction and works that are more in the real world. Okay. This is one of my favorite photographers. I don't know how to say the name correctly, but it's Lala Asadi. But anyway, um, she's a Moroccan contemporary photographer. And this seems like this would be up your alley, Lauren. <laughs> All the patterns and... <laughs> yes, she's been recommended to me several times because here we're talking about something really cool and really different. We're talking about compressing space. So getting rid of this, making everything super flat, which is the opposite of what we were talking about, about creating the illusion of deep space. So this work, it's exploring um, the Arabic female identity. And I just love the way that this artist uses the patterns, the drapery, the writing. I mean, you would think that if you blended all these things together, that it would just be total chaos. But there's something about the way the writing wraps through in the figure, into the background, back into the figure, that makes it really cohesive. I mean, I love this one where the figure is almost like melting into the tile of the floor. Yeah, definitely. And I think that this is really good opportunity to talk about how you can take things that originally have volume and work with the edges. I think this has a lot to do with edges and how edges relate to each other in a, a positive shape, a positive form. Here it's the figure and how you can manipulate those edges to either bleed into the background or stand out from the background. Well, I think this photographer does an amazing job of knowing when something should pop mm -hmm. and knowing when something should just sink into that background. Because it, this is such an interesting triptych that the two figures on the far left, because of the darkness of the hair, they really pop 
And then the middle almost looks flat. And then you see this figure like emerging out of that. So I, I like this work because it's recognizable imagery, it's human figures, cloth and architecture, but they're completely fabricated spaces, right? Yes. And also I like what you said about the hair and the faces standing out because there again is that use of contrast, the idea of having something that is more I'm going to say flat or non-patterned. That's another way to use that contrast. Having a, that creates a very bold shape that is unlike the rest. And so your eye goes towards that before trying to pick out the nuances of the area around it. Charisma is saying, do you have any tips or things to do to emphasize or span depth within a work? Scale. One of the easiest ways to show depth. So can you explain that, Lauren? What do we mean by using scale to show depth? Scale is the literal size of your subjects or objects within your work. A lot of the times, I, I think the most common way that we've seen this is having a little itty bitty tiny figure and a very, 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 very large landscape. Oftentimes, I think using the body and its relationship with its surroundings is probably the thing that we're most aware of because our bodies exist in surroundings. We go through that every day. But you can also do this with, say, still life objects as well. You can emphasize the importance of something, make it really huge, and then make the area around it really compressed and small. I'm thinking of Escher does this, has these pieces where an entire room is compressed in a, in a large glass object. Another way that's great to think about it is if you have an object like, say, a street lamp. Street lamps tend to be the same size if they're on the same street. And if you go deeper into the space, the farther away the street lamps get, the smaller they become. And so that's where scale is it's just so straightforward. It's like, you don't have to deal with anything else. It's just make it smaller. And then it looks like it's further away. All right, let's take a look at a comics artist. This is Alison Bechtel. And Bechtel's work has been very popular. Um, they won a MacArthur Genius Grant. And I think isn't the most famous comic, isn't it Fun Home, Lauren? Yeah, Fun Home is a graphic novel that is about um, their life growing up in a house that their family, their dad is obsessed with building and then her coming of age story, I guess. It's, it's really good. But the spaces are, I was so glad that you used this work as an example of space because I had not thought of that, but it's like the space is incredibly important to the story. Yeah, and the spaces get manipulated in very different ways. Sometimes the classic linear perspective situation in this diner that you guys are seeing, but I love this image with the windows where, yes, it looks flat, but the implication of the space behind the curtains is quite grand. I think that's amazing. And there's other stuff going on in here too. We can start talking about how the context or the setup of the space lends to the content of the work. So here, having this, this flattened interruption of the exterior of the house that interrupts the her character with the father is uh, is really related to the story and that division of these these separate lives going on, these separate worlds. Maria says, I've seen several artists work with characters and space that didn't follow the same perspective or just didn't match. They make it look on purpose and beautiful. When I do it, it's just bad. It's hard to pull off. I mean, you, you really are like inventing a whole new language from scratch. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes it's that awkward space where it's like, it's almost correct, not quite. And so it feels even more awkward. It takes a lot of practice. It's not easy, I think, to invent that type of world. Now, on the other hand, this also, uh, Alison Bechtel also has images like this, where it's like huge space, this gigantic airport. And I think comics have an enormous challenge in that usually graphic novels are very long, 
usually they have so many different types of places. I think as a comics artist, you have to be incredibly versatile in terms of showing space. The other thing about comic artists, at least that I've seen, is that, you know, who you're talking about that interval thing at the beginning between two objects. A lot of comic artists have to draw multiple people and their relationship in space with each other. And I find that extremely hard. You have to have a really good understanding of how multiple bodies relate to each other in space, within a space. Well, I mean, if you guys look at the top image, you can almost map out the space according to the people. Like you have the figure in the front, that's the largest. You have the people going back into the distance. And so it's not so much that you have to draw the background as much as you have to like map out in your head, okay, what is the situation that I'm looking at here? And that's where your mindset really comes into play. Like this is great. These rows of car seats, don't you just love this? Yeah, this feels very much like all of the horrible family vacations I've ever been on. And I just like looking at it because it's so accurate to what it feels like to be in a car, a very cramped car. Well, and this is also a good one because in addition to scale, you can also talk about overlap as a way to show space. So do you guys see how I guess it's the dad that's driving the car? there's a kid behind the dad. And you know that because the dad overlaps. It's like, again, if you just use overlap and scale, those two things are gonna set you up for success. So if you have trouble processing the other stuff, like the lighting and the negative space, go for overlap and scale. You, you will totally have half the battle won at that point. Yes. Okay. Let's take a look at Angela Dufresne. This is your pick, Lauren. So tell us about this work. I think it's hard for me to pinpoint what it is that makes Angela Dufresne's spaces so believable and so extreme because we don't, I don't know if it's necessarily all in color here, which is what, you know, I'm, I'm attuned to because everything is very muddy in the middle and yet you have these reflective surfaces. I feel like it might have a lot to do with light that creates this really intense sense of scale. There's this tiny, tiny boat in the middle and the way that the light is reflecting from the sky onto the ocean and back again is making that space feel very, very large and also not boring, not flat at all. Well, I'll tell you, Lauren, some of my favorite artwork in terms of space is a work where you don't know how big the space is. You don't know if you're looking at something microscopic or maybe it's on a more grand scale. I mean, that that's another way to work with space where things are not so clear cut. Yeah, it reminds me of this. Her work reminds me of this kind of photography. I forget what it's called, but it makes objects look like little toys, like very small toys. It's stop frame tilt shift, tilt shift photography. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> my my artist roommate is helping me out. Um, yes, tilt chip photography, which is very much about edges and blurring the edges versus making very clear cut, crisp edges. And I think that's what is happening here. That red it looks like a ski lift is really coming up in in my vision. And then those those mountains in the back really fall back because they are are blurred out. Cerulean is asking, what about space that does not have correct perspective? Seems like I've seen a lot of work where the perspective is really exaggerated and or warped. It's hard to comment on it without an example because everything is case by case. I think it's similar to what Maria said earlier that, listen, if you're going to mess it up, mess it up. Linear perspective is one of those things, it's right or wrong. Like there is no in between. And your average person off the street may not be able to tell you what's wrong, but they'll know it's wrong. So that's what's tricky. Yeah, I think this really has to do with any other thing that you want to make be extraordinary or outside of reality. I have the same issues with anatomy and how to make incorrect anatomy look believable and correct. 
And it's very much, again, coming back to you make your own world. And people don't necessarily care how that world corresponds with the real world. They just are trying to figure out the rules of your world. It's just practice. Dara says, this artist does a lot of interesting things with the middle brown colors. Yeah, and that is absolutely contributing to the sense of space. Like, especially here, where you see these like pockets of pink yeah. and saturated blue that start to leap forward. And you know what I really like about this work is that I think they're doing a really great job of dividing the space up into zones. So you guys might hear me talk about this where, okay, we have this pocket here, we have a zone here, we have a zone there. And so you can sort of subdivide the space in your head so it doesn't feel so overwhelming. Yeah, I want to say in that last painting, Clara, there is another thing that's happening that I think is important called figure ground reversal. And that is where the ground or the space or the background takes a kind of precedence, takes the positive shape, the positive associations over the figure or what we would normally consider the subject. The subject here is almost cut out. They're, they're very brown, they're very grayed out. And so we understand that subject based on that surrounding space and how that surrounding space is dictating both those outlines and is just contrasting in color and detail and form and all of that. I mean, to me, Lauren, the most exciting part of this painting is the floor. I think the floor is amazing. The yeah. way that the figures dance across that surface, the lighting, the shadow, these are all contributing to the illusion of space. Yeah, like this one, you can think about one zone as the space behind the arches that are on the right, this mm -hmm. like bluish turquoise landscape. And you could say, okay, there's another zone that's right in front of us. And there's another zone on the left. So some of this I think is just analyzing what you're looking at. Oh yeah, totally. Your zones, Clara, I, I love that we're having this conversation because it's helping me figure out how we determine the same elements or the same things about the work. Your zones are what I would consider my worlds, where they each have their own logic that then together makes sense because they have this contained world logic within them. Yeah, like this is a great one. It's not as wild as some of the other compositions we've seen by the same artist, but it still has zones. There's a zone in the water, those boats in the front. Mm -hmm. There's another row of buildings behind it. And then up above, we have another scene at the top of the cityscape. So think about dividing your work like that. Like next time you guys sit down, you make a composition. Think about how that works. I just thought this was a cute comment from Angelic Enigma. Do you have a permit for that precious <laughs> blue? <laughs> Lauren, I'm sorry to tell you, me and Prussian blue, I don't know I want to date Prussian blue anymore. I think it might be over for us. <laughs> you know what, Clara? I actually, I've only just started using Prussian blue. That's really an Alex color. I am all ultra, but I've just graduated to cobalt impression. I thought Alex was all about cobalt. He's not into Prussian. I think he's into Prussian. Prussian's like a real old school color. Oh, see, I'm like a cerulean blue girl. But anyway, me and Prussian What's your favorite blue? blue in the chat, guys? Please tell us. Yeah, tell us, tell us in the chat. With, well, see, I'm a cerulean girl, but I'm also, my comfort zone is ultramarine blue. So I was trying Prussian blue, but I, I don't think it's going to work out for us. I, I think it's almost over. <laughs> you know, I think, I think my blue, <laughs> you guys are going to hate me. My blue is Thala blue. Ew! <laughs> Thala blue is the worst! How can you like <laughs> it? It does all the right things for me. It's the most versatile of all the blues, for me, at least. Oh. <laughs> okay, while you guys work out your issues with blue. Let's take a look at Toba Kadori, who I think, especially just looking at Angela Dufresne's work, does so much with so little. I love Toba Kadori's work because it's just utter bare bones. And mm -hmm. these are huge drawings. I've never seen them in person, but they're gigantic. And 
there's so little on that page. And yet the amount of space that's conveyed is magnificent, in my opinion. Yeah, this <laughs> we could have brought Toba Kadori's work up in the 2D compositions, bad, good 2D composition stream, because this, yeah, I agree. The negative space and the proportions, this is all about proportions. The proportions of that to actual information is what is doing all of the work there. And it feels like it's not a lot of information, but sometimes you get a lot more out of things unsaid than said things. I want to pull up this question from Dara who says, do zones refer to depth in the image or the areas of composition? Well, if I'm talking about zones, I'm talking about depth in the image. That's my terminology. But yeah, that's a great question to clarify because actually it can get very confusing after a little while talking yeah. about all this stuff. And and of course they're related too. And depth is part of composition or the composition helps create the depth. So yeah, I agree with Clara, but it's still relating back to composition. Slepnir is asking, does Toba Kadori also do assemblage? I think some of these are collaged pieces. I don't think this one, but this one I think is like multiple sheets of tracing paper that are on top of each other. I mean, I've never seen this piece in real life, so I really don't know, but I don't think that these are just single sheets of paper. I mean, maybe this one is, but a lot of them are like multiple pieces that are put together. Anyway, this is one of my favorite examples of Space Lord, and it's so small. I love it. Yeah, it's so understated. It's hard to do minimalism well. And I just keep, this is also a tonal issue here too. Look at how that, how much attention is paid to getting the values just right. Because if this was just really dark versus really light, it would be a totally different image and would not imply that same space going through it. Yeah, like Mike is saying, I love the stick board leaning against the wall, amazing illusion of space. You know why? Because you are looking at the interval between the stick yeah, and the wall. Good and you know work. there's a wall because of that cast shadow. Good work, bring that back <laughs> to the beginning, Clara. Because you know, Lauren, sometimes I think people think they need like a Gothic cathedral to have space. I'm like, no, y you could just have the space that's in between the Art Prof mug merch is <laughs> all his space, you know? Yeah, space can be very, space does not have a content hierarchy, I guess. There can be very humble, wonderful spaces that can show great emotion, great sense of environment, great depth. It's just how you choose to portray that. I'm glad you brought that up because I do think space can feel emotional. Yes. I don't think space is just physical stuff. And yes. actually, this artist we're going to look at now, I think, is a great example of that. This is Titus. Is it Kfar? I don't have to say any of these <laughs> artist names. But anyway, um, he's been getting a lot of attention in the art world recently. He got a MacArthur Genius Grant. And his work is really, really interesting. It's all about history of representation. And really what he's doing is he's like reconfiguring history. So if you look up his stuff, look it up because it's fascinating. He like cuts things out and rearranges and cuts up the, ca I don't know, I just love the work. And this is such a great example because these are realistic images of people. You can recognize them, but the spaces are not realistic. Yeah, this is, toying with the illusionistic space and if you want the art history on that kind of stuff it's actually really related to abstract art in the whole clement greenberg era where you have stuff that's on the top that's that makes you think about the surface of the canvas versus this illusionistic space which makes you not think about the surface of the canvas which makes you think about the world that's being depicted and makes you feel like you live in the space. So here we have this contrast of these two types of looking that is creating this tension of space. 
Lindsay is saying it's like a portal into another world. A lot of people actually talk about painting that way. Have you heard that, Lauren, that people say, oh, the painting is a window into another yes. world? Yes. I mean, that's one way to think about it for sure. I literally just paint, made a painting that was a trompeloy of a window, that like a, a straight on window. So <laughs> right there with you guys. So this is a great example of some of the things that Titus Kafar does with the cutouts. And he's got some other ones that are more dramatic, but definitely look at his stuff because it's very exciting work. And then this one where it's like the image is almost gone. W315Bird says the canvas is window versus canvas is flat plane. That is the most succinct and perfect way to put it. Thank you very much. I want to write my artist statement. I wish I could be that succinct. <laughs> yeah. yeah, me too. <laughs> when talking about artwork. We take 35 minutes to explain just one thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love the drama of these, Lauren, because I think it's hard to merge abstract passages with such visibly recognizable figurative images. Like, to me, this really has a harshness to it that really packs a punch. And I think you guys will find if you go and you look at his work that, wow, there's a lot going on there. Okay, printmaking nerd. I just had to make a push for Sydney Hurwitz and Via Selmans because you know what else you guys? We're doing our first print along on Saturday. I'm so Ooh. excited. Ooh. We're gonna do trace prototypes. I wanna tune into that one. That one sounds like fun. Fun, it's so fast. Anyway. What Via Salmons does is not fast. <laughs> no, 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 no. The slowest drawing in the whole universe. How, <laughs> many, how many years do these take to make? I don't even know. I mean, I think some of these, it's like two or three years to finish, which is insane to me. Like, how do you have that type of patience? Yeah, I highly recommend to any person that is looking at these right now, Go to a museum and see one in person because the image does not do them justice. It is the equivalent of seeing one of those high resolution, like super resolution NASA photos where you can zoom in forever and see galaxies that are billions of miles away. Via Selman's is the same except with printmaking and I think sometimes graphite, right? Well, so this image I'm showing you guys here, this one's graphite, okay? But th this is what blew my mind, Lord. This is where I was like, oh, man. So, you know, people look at this, they're like, oh, it's just like one of the graphite drawings. No, this is a wood yeah. cut. It's like, killing me. what? <laughs> so, so this one, this one, as far as space goes, this is defining space by use of detail, which is the one that I think people like to use the most is they want to make they want to do nice details but if you really want to commit to doing something like that when you're thinking about space this is the kind of this is the person you should be looking at this is a commitment i feel so lazy whenever i look at her work I'm i know, like, oh, no, me too. i have no attention span um really quick Clara, where have you seen Via Selman's work? I've seen in New York. I saw the work when I went to the print collection at the Met. I don't know if you guys yeah. knew this, but anybody can do that. I mean, I went with my graduate school class, but you can call up the print collection at any museum and say, hi, I would like to see this Kathy Kollowitz and please pull Albert Durer's Adam and Eve. And you, they just pull it out and there's no frame. There's no glass. It's like you and Durer right there. So good. She's famous enough that her work is in a lot of countries, in a lot of states, in a lot of museums. If <laughs> I can't list it in every single place, but I know that I've seen her work in Boston and I know that I've seen her work in New York in several places. Yeah, you guys, th this really is work you need to see in person. I mean, I think it probably looks fairly ordinary through a digital photo, but this was one of those moments that you, you just remember it forever as an artist. It's, it's, it's our, our technology resolution cannot compete with Via Selman's resolution. 
<laughs> the human w, w315 says, what kind of wood is that mahogany filled with plaster? I actually don't know what type of wood it is, but I suspect if you want to do something that is that crazy amount of detail, you probably want something really hard like cherry or something like that. So anyway, it would not be something soft like pine. It'd have to be something a lot harder than that. Mike is saying the original Dura prints. What? Wow, yes! Guys, like, oh my God. I looked at that Dura thing. I'm like, I don't know how you physically make this. Like, I don't understand the physics. Clara, can you even do that where you just go into a special collections place at universities? Say, could any one of us go to the RISD Museum special collections and say, hey, I want to see this? Or is our universities barred off for certain people or students or whatever? It depends on the school because sometimes special collections is not part of the museum. Sometimes it's a whole separate entity. Like at Wellesley College, special collections was not part of the museum. At RISD, you could go to the RISD Museum print collection, but the special collections I think is in the library. I don't know, you have to look at the school and find out how it works. It's all very different. Anyway, guys, we do have these other videos that explore the elements of art that you guys can check out. And remember, we have many of the Google slideshows that we use in our streams are available. So if you guys want this slideshow, you want to revisit it later, the link is in the YouTube video description below. We do have an Art Prof Share today. Art Prof Share is where one of you guys creates an artwork in response to one of our videos. And so today, our art prof share is Shabnan Nikhu. And Shabnan says in their statement, this is my first time trying animation. I've been trying new things in digital art. And Shabnan watched this video, which was me and C and Lark Reese. I learned how to do a ball bounce. I never thought it would happen. <laughs> which by the way, is also part of our animation curriculum for self-taught artists. And Shabnan says, even any title with quote animation in it has always been intriguing and scary. But when I noticed this video is all about making a ball bounce, I thought, how hard it, how hard could it be? Shabnan says, I tried it, such a joyful experience. I'm not scared of trying to make simple animations anymore. I'm encouraged to try more and explore more. How did they do, Lauren? Oh, I love it. It is so <laughs> cute. And I have to say that, Shabnam, you have taken the leap. I have not tried this yet because I am also scared. I love hearing about your experience. And I think it's worked very believably there. The the squishiness when it hit, <laughs> hits the ground, that's the really effective part. I love it. It's so satisfying, Lauren. Like I'm one of those people, I'm so intimidated by animation. So when Cian said he was gonna show me how to bounce a ball and procreate, I was like, what? I can't do this. <laughs> I mean, he was there to like really hold my hand, but you guys should try this tutorial. It's incredibly accessible and I had a blast. So go watch this video if you get a chance. If you guys wanna be considered for a YouTube shout out, just go to artprof.org and click on tutorials. You wanna click on this purple button and that will take you to the submission form where you guys can submit your stuff. Or if you guys wanna just tag us on Instagram, use hashtag artprofshare. We love sharing what you guys make in our Instagram stories. Artprof has a podcast, it's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And in a few minutes, Lauren and I will be hanging out in the ArtProf Discord. We will be in the post live streams channel if you guys want to chat more about Albert Durr and Via Selmans, we'll be there. Subscribe to our channel so you can continue to grow and develop as an artist. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters. You guys are giving us the resources we need to keep ArtProf up and running. And Lauren, look at this. It's growing. It's Everybody, our second slide. See how it's getting longer? Everybody on the second slide is going to get so much attention. I feel bad for the people on the first slide. Here, let's go back. They're, they're getting a few more seconds of air time. See? <laughs> anyway, you guys, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.